Hayır, one thing is not for joining us. We continue reading the New Testament and now we are reading Luke 14. Is it right to heal on the Sabbath day? On a Sabbath day, Jesus went to the home of a leading Pharisee to eat with him. The people there were all watching him very closely. A man with a bad disease was there in front of him. Jesus said to the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it right or wrong to heal on the Sabbath day? But they would not answer his question. So he took the man and healed him. Then he sent the man away. Jesus said to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, if your son or work animal falls into a well on the Sabbath day, you know you would pull him out immediately. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law could say nothing against what he said. Don't make yourself important. Yeah. Then Jesus noticed that some of the guests were choosing the best places to sit. So he told this story. When someone invites you to a wedding, don't sit in the most important seat. They may have invited someone more important than you. And if you're sitting in the most important seat, they will come to you and say, give this man your seat. Then you will have to move down to the last place and be embarrassed. So when someone invites you, go sit in the seat that is not important. Then they will come to you and say, friend, move up here to this better place. What an honor this will be for you in front of all the other guests. Everyone who makes themselves important will be made humble, but everyone who makes themselves humble will be made important. You will be rewarded. Then Jesus said to the Pharisee who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite only your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors. At another time, they will pay you back by inviting you to eat with them. Instead, when you give a feast, Invite the poor, the crippled, and the blind. Then you will have great blessings because these people cannot pay you back. They have nothing. But God will reward you at the time when all godly people rise from death. A story about people invited to a dinner. We also see this in Matthew 22. One of the men sitting at the table with Jesus heard these things. The man said to him, it will be a great blessing for anyone to eat a meal in God's kingdom. Jesus said to him, A man gave a big dinner, and he invited many people. When it was time to eat, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the food is ready. But all the guests said they could not come. Each one made an excuse. The first one said, I have just bought a field, so I must go look at it. Please excuse me. Another man said, I have just bought five pairs of work animals. I must go and try them out. Please excuse me. A third man said, I just got married. I can't come. So the servant returned and told his master what happened. The master was angry. He said, hurry, go into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring me the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Later, the servant said to him, Master, I did what you told me to do, but... We still have places for more people. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways and country roads. Tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. I tell you, not one of these people I invited first will eat any of this food I prepared. Decide if you can follow me. We also see this in Matthew 10. Many people were traveling with Jesus. He said to them, If you come to me but will not leave your family, you cannot be my follower. You must love me more than your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, even more than your own life. Whoever will not carry the cross that's given to them, then they will follow me, cannot be my follower. If you want to build a building, you would first sit down and decide how much it would cost. You must see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't do that, and you might begin the work, but you would not be able to finish it. And if you could not finish it, everyone would laugh at you. They would say, this man began to build, but he was not able to finish. If a king is going to fight against another king, first he will sit down and plan. If he has only 10,000 men, he will try to decide if he is able to defeat the other king who has 20,000 men. 
if he thinks he cannot defeat the other king, he will send some men to ask for peace while that king's army is still far away. It is the same for each of you. You must leave everything you have to follow me. If not, you cannot be my follower. Don't lose your influence. We also see this in Matthew 5 and Mark 9. Salt is a good thing, but if the salt loses its salty taste, you can't make it salty again. It is worth nothing. You can't even use it as dirt or dung. People just throw it away. You people who hear me, listen. Amen. Amen. Jesus told these words several times. You people who hear me, hmm. listen. We we came across to it in other chapters earlier and also other books of, uh, I'm not sure Mark or Matthew or yeah, both. Both actually, yeah. Hmm. And we are all hearing. We are all hearing, for instance, we go to church and hear the homily. We hear someone telling words from our book, The Good News. We are all hearing. Sometimes even maybe angel saints using other people's mouths to give us the news that we need to hear. We are all hearing, but the problem, are we li really listening what we hear? Are we really capable of making a meaning and giving the right importance to the things that we hear? Jesus, for a reason, brings this again and again. You people who hear, listen. And there are perhaps, since he words it this way, there are perhaps other people who cannot even hear. And they will never hear at all. That's why Jesus always brings up separating wheat from the yield, separating good fish and bad fish. There are those maybe they will never hear at all. But those who hear, please also listen what we are hearing. This uh, chapter was very short, but very compact with so many examples. So many teaching stories, all of them could be expanded perhaps to one hour conversation we could discuss and comment on. I feel like every paragraph here is a, a summary of a teaching that Jesus wants to give. These are specific examples from Jesus teaching us how we should live our lives. In the previous chapter, we have already seen Jesus was healing on Sabbath day, and people didn't like that. People said, we've got six other days, why do you heal on Sabbath day? And Jesus said, it's not about six days or healing on seventh day, it's about doing the right thing. If your neighbor comes to you asking help, you need to help, if you are the one who can help. And he says, you are even give food, water to your animals. Then why we shouldn't heal someone who suffered 13 years? And he is uh, coming here to break the unnecessary rules that human brain develop, not God has given, but they are put as religious rules, which do not serve us. Our religion didn't come as a religion. Our religion came as love of God to us. Not to set unnecessary rules to please a God sitting on the throne. No, to let us live peacefully and find our way back to his heaven, to his kingdom. And here again, we see Jesus this time asking, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath day? And uh, he's bringing up again to religious leaders. Of course, they will be more and more and more becoming enemies to Jesus by hearing that because this is against rules. But Jesus doesn't follow rule. Jesus follows one rule, love of God. And doing the right thing when it's required. 
He says, don't make yourself important. Don't think that I, I came here to get these goodies, sit on the front chair, sit on the VIP, and uh, I deserve this and that. No, if you live your life like that, you will become one of those billionaires, maybe. You will become maybe one of those uh, Instagram influencer. You will be one of those uh, CEOs who who is all the time on TV or newspapers. And you will not be happy. God's kingdom is upside down kingdom. Who is just coming to church and being a great person, praying, doing his job, and living the life that Jesus commanded as the first place in the kingdom of heaven. He just gives us assurance that we will be rewarded for what we do, what we uh, just get rid of in our earthly mind here. If we think that we only cook for riches to make a party feast in our backyard and we invite only uh, some CEOs and rich people, who can also maybe give us a position later on. If we make such calculations, we end up miserable because God's plans do not work like that. God's plan work different. If you are cooking for a public, give it instead of someone who is on the street under the um, bridge who needs food. And if you are doing it for someone who cannot give you back, then you are really doing it. For God, about living our life dedicated to Jesus, are we able to do that? If you come to me, but you do not leave your family, you cannot be my follower. If your your first condition in your in your mind is to make your mother happy, make your father happy, to become the to get the degrees that your mama papa wants, or to make your siblings happy. So they can be uh, just feeling good about you to choose the life that you, your siblings find most, most safe for themselves. And if you are even uh, putting your wife, your husband, your children as the first place, my child has to be the number one in the school. That's your ultimate priority. Or uh, just washing my husband with... Uh, unnecessary gifts uh, just to get his attention that if, if it's my ultimate primary goal then you are not the follower on the other hand if you are the follower they all benefit from this even if you are not talking to them I've got family members that I do not talk and I do believe that by becoming a person who lives a healthy life I'm honoring them. And you will be still honoring them, making them, even if they don't realize that, by the way, maybe they, they are just drinking or their, their mind is not there. Still deep inside their soul, someday in the future, in the judgment day, will see that you honored them at the time. Put Jesus in the first place, everything else will settle down will find their places like puzzle pieces the puzzle will be complete let me accept our cross put it on our shoulder and say yes i'm following you yeah seek seek first the kingdom as he says and we've read that also in matthew um, the rest shall be added on to you and as we've also read in luke uh, several chapters earlier where your uh, treasure is there your heart is also so lay not your treasure on earth where thieves can break in and um, moths can corrode and corrupt. And and he's really, um, it is interesting the way you um, mentioned too, how often he he says, let him who have ear, hath ears uh, listen, you know, not just hear, but listen. It, it is repeat, repeated so frequently in these gospels. And, and as we've seen already in Matthew, um, much of that is quoted directly from Isaiah, where Isaiah expresses it in the negative sense. He says, there are many here, but none listen. Many 
uh, look but none see. And, and Christ, as he tells his disciples in some of the earlier chapters we've read in Luke, he says, you know, you are so blessed because you are able to see what uh, sages and what uh, why the wise could not see. And then he also praises God for making um, what is um, plain to the babes, as he says in the old um, English uh, version of uh, King James, or, or uh, plain to those who, who have become like little children that are childlike. Um, they have no hidden agendas. It becomes plain while it's kept hidden from the wise. So what, what we really, I believe, and we discuss this too in our commentary, and we, I think we especially see it here in Luke, is that um, Christ recognizes that, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. He is here. The, the wedding feast is here. But he also expresses um, his sadness and sorrow that um, many are called, but uh, few are chosen, not because of any fault of God, but because so few are willing to open their hearts and they eyes. They do not listen. They do not listen. And, um, it, it, you know, just looking at the progression of these particular parables, and we've seen other versions of them in the previous Gospels, but here this is uniquely compiled by Luke. Um, I find the actual um, interconnection um, of, of interest, like, you know, he starts off in this short chapter um, by silencing the Pharisees and his critics. Apparently the man that he uh, healed at the um, at the dinner was suffering from, um, according to the footnotes, uh, dropsy, which is a very serious disease. It's when, uh, I, I don't know the medical causes of it, but it sounds like um, similar to hyponitremia when you're body begins to swell because your electrolytes are in disequilibrium you, you you die from this disease you basically you know your body begins to uncontrollably swell so it's not just uh, something superficial it's it's worse than leprosy so there's an urgency there and and it's interesting the way he silences the pharisees by saying um you know you would pull your 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 farm animal out if they fell in a well or a child um even if it's on the sabbath day and it, goes back to the, you know, the distractions of unnecessary rules, which aren't religious at all. They're just contrivances of the ego. And of course, uh, none of them could respond to Christ because they know full well he's right. And then he goes on to say, which is interesting too, you know, um, in the next section, um, everyone who makes themselves important will be made humble, but everyone who makes themselves humble will be made important. And in um, our Eucharist, you know, in Mass, we always say that, you know, Christ, we're not worthy of, of your sacrifice. We, we, the, the act of, of, of contrition and, um, and making yourself, as, as Christ says too, the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Um, this is such a beautiful parable that Christ is illustrating here is that, you know, if you put yourself last in this great wedding feast, which of course, is the bridegroom, the the Son of God incarnating. If you put yourself last, you will be richly rewarded. If, on the other hand, you presume you have special favors with, uh, as his disciples, uh, some of them, like uh, John and James, um, um, were arguing over, you, you'll be um, you'll be appropriately chastised. Um, and so, so moving from the shedding the unnecessary rules to um, the making yourself humble, he he goes on to say, and like you were saying in the upside down world, that uh, you'll be more blessed um, if you can um, invite those and you can serve those who cannot pay you back. God will reward you at the time when all godly people rise from death. And that, again, I think stops the ego and the mind in its tracks because we realize that the kingdom of heaven and um, the divine is really incommensurate. It's incompatible with the earthly realm where everything is based on linearity, on expectations, on transactions, but also everything is ephemeral. Like you mentioned, the treasures that we often lay upon earth where Christ says anyone who values those treasures cannot be my disciple. You have to carry your cross. Um, you know, those those treasures like 
for instance, wanting your child to be first in school, these are ephemeral. Um, they they don't they don't even begin to reflect what really matters, which is the um, the the value and the eternal um, beauty of the soul that's created by God. If you this is what Christ is really exhorting us to do to love as He loves. And so I, I read this chapter here also, where He says that um, you know Christ says. Um, in the parable of the wealthy man inviting people to the to the dinner, tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. I tell you, not one of these people I invited first will eat any of these food I prepared. Um, he's saying that it's precisely those who aren't distracted by so much of the worldly um, ephemera that um, at the end of the day are are insubstantial. All is vanity and vexation of the spirit. Those who are left who have that humble heart can also recognize the immeasurable beauty and the immeasurable spiritual um, reality that is within us all and within our souls that God blesses. But again, Christ says, you know, many, many are called, but few are chosen. There, there are very few who, um, unfortunately, can rise to that occasion. That's why Christ says, you know, the harvest is big, but the workers are few. And um, so, so reading the next section where he says, you must love me more than your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, even more than your own life. Whoever will not carry the cross that is given um, when they follow me cannot be my follower. It, um, and, and he describes it in terms of counting the cost. It's like you, um, as, as C.S. Lewis, and this is something we have um, also um, reflected on and commented in some of the earlier chapters, as C.S. Lewis also says, one thing is clear is you cannot remain indifferent to Christ's message. Either you reject it or if you believe it, it has ultimate importance. And you cannot remain wishy-washy. You cannot remain lukewarm. You, you cannot remain ambivalent. And here Christ is reminding us of that. Um, on the flip side, he also says, you know, my burden is light. My yoke is easy precisely because he is connecting you as the seeker of God's love. He's connecting your heart with the ever abundant and limitless bounty of God's grace. So once you recognize that and open up your heart, why would you not want to follow him? As he says, you know, he who's not against us is with us. Even the example mm. of child and mother, for instance, mm. If the mother is showing the love to mm -hmm. child, uh, only wanting the child will be the first in the class, mm -hmm. will be the one who can ride a horse and uh, throw the best arrow, uh, showing the best skills, mm -hmm. uh, plays the best piano, and uh, one course after another, one thing after uh, word after in a, another, mm -hmm. um, stage one basically. Mm -hmm. How do you see that this mom loves the child? How does the child mm. experience mother's love? Mm. I believe the child is just exhausted and feeling close but not bounded. Uh, close in terms of daily experience, but too far away, too distant as spiritual experience mm. of being bonded to a motherly figure. It, it will be terrible for the child and the child will be feeling like being used for egos, mm. satisfying egos of the mother. Because mother wants to show herself through the child. But what, what about the mom who follows Jesus first? even puts Jesus before the child. The mother knows that that child is a gift to her from Christ. And she realizes that Holy Spirit brought that child all the gifts of the heaven. He gave him unique charism. He gave him life, heartbeat. All the organs functioning well or not, but beautifully making the life happen and enabling the mom 
to taste that motherly feeling in the life, the mother would be only feeling thankful, having the gift of heaven, feeling blessed, and she would she can only turn back to child to give compassion, to give presence, to give the celebration of life, to show thankfulness, to reflect her thankfulness. And that's the only thing child needs. Of course, the child has other needs like eating, drinking, going to school for education, maybe finding a job somewhere. But those come. The child who doesn't get this real appreciation and connection with mom will be miserable no matter what schools, what kind of brand beer that you put, what kind of schools that you send. The person's life will be miserable while growing and uh, after. That's how important is following Jesus Christ and putting himself first because everything else can get the meaning through him, with him, in him, only. Indeed, and um, it's, uh, I think it's an eternal um, pattern too that, um, you know, we think of words like stage mom and they seem so contemporary, but I, when you were describing this example, I, I couldn't help but think of the biography of um, someone whom we'll read here too, of, of St. Paul, uh, who, a.k.a. Saul of Tarsus, because prior to his conversion, you can, from his um, uh, his own uh, confessions, he, he lived to please his father, and his father was a prominent Pharisee who um, sent him to Rabbi Gamaliel for further teachings, um, primarily just to um, show off how important his family was. And of course, the young Saul wanted to do everything to please his father, which went so far as to uh, end up um, killing Christians, um, you know. And um, we, we see this so often that uh, not only do children suffer when parents um, place concerns about status and concerns about um, prestige um, and, and make their children sacrificial lambs to that. But then we also see children's in a desperate in a desperate attempt to win the affection and approval of their parents, likewise harming themselves and others. And um, <laughs> as a kind of a hypothetical question, what if uh, uh, Saul's parents also became converts to Christ? We don't know if this ever happened. What would that have done to their relationship? And indeed, as Christ says too, seek ye first the kingdom, the rest shall be added on to you. You have that as the foundation, that relationship and that love and all else just flows naturally from it in its proper, healthy way. I feel like he would mm. write more books. <laughs> yeah, he probably would. He would have more to read. Yeah, the New okay. Testament would be longer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in the next chapter where we will see joy in heaven. And we will hear more stories to explain us how to live while we are here on earth to meet with our father already. Yeah. So looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now. Bye for now.